Okay, so we're going to start off the Ohio Cast podcast with uh, number five. You're number five, by the way. We, you know, we just started this one. Um, we've got Barbarian Hour. We've got a couple of different ones that we do. Uh, we got Kent State Wrestling, and now we're going to talk John Carroll Wrestling with head coach of the men's team, Coach Mark Hale. And, and women's. No, I'm and, head coach of both, yeah. You're the head coach of both, but you also have hired a coach who is going to focus specifically on – because you're going to be split between the two, right? You're going to be doing men's and right. women's? Who did so, you hire? So I'm the, head, I'm the head men's and women's coach. Our associate head coach for women's is Autumn Gordon. Um, so, so the model eventually we'd like to get to is, is I, I will remain as head coach of both programs and we'd have associate head coaches for both. Currently we just have a women's associate head coach. So, okay. You, you answered my question. You will eventually hire an associate head coach for men's and for women's. And then you will remain the head of both programs. Is that, is that what I'm gathering? Out of that? Yeah. Yeah. And, and really the, the reason behind that is, um, I mean, I'm excited about the women's program, but I think that the real uh, motivation was if you don't, in my opinion, at least, if you don't have one person responsible for both programs and the success the success of both programs, I, I'd be nervous about the future of the women's team, right? If I'm the men's coach and they're sharing my space, I, I might be a little selfish, but they're my team. You know, they're my family, just like the men are. So, so we're going to treat them both the same and, and treat them both right. How does that whole process begin? Like how far back uh, do you start looking into starting a women's program? Do you approach the AD? Does the AD approach you? How does that even go to add women's wrestling? Uh, it was, well, like it was like set in passing, I guess, when when D, uh, NCAA did the, uh, what's the word? I can't think of it now. Uh, emerging? Emerging yes, status? Right, emerging sport. Yeah, when it became that, it was kind of like set in passing. But um really about a year ago, it got serious. Um, I just saw the growth of it. I wanted to be on the front end of it. And I said, we got to do this. So, so it was all me. I mean, it, it was, it was the work of many people, but, but it was my kind of work on the front end, um, to make sure it happened. I was, I don't know. I just got the bug in my head. I'm like, John Carroll needs women's wrestling. Let's go. And so it's, it's, it was really at about a, well, we start if now it's in July, but probably started about September, October of last year. So for people who don't know much about John Carroll University, you guys are in University Heights on the east side of Cleveland. Is that correct? Yep. And probably, what, 15 minutes from downtown Cleveland, if that? Without traffic. <laughs> yeah. Without traffic, yeah. Not a good day, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah. How far is that from Case? Are they about seven minutes apart then? Yeah, I mean, I would say if, let's say you're driving, you're going to go to to uh, the stadium, they're about halfway between us and the stadium. So it's, uh, I think we're like 10 miles, maybe nine miles to like the rock hall, you know, the stadium, all that stuff. So yeah. they're, they're probably four or five. Listen, I took my son to his first experience nice. at first energy stadium. And we parked at the very end of the Muni lot and we walked through there and he's six years old and he couldn't articulate into words what he was seeing occur in front of his eyes. Luckily, no nudity. I mean, obviously, he heard some very colorful language, but um, he was like, Dad, why did we park at the end of the parking lot? Why did we have to walk through all this? And I was like, because I wanted to save $40, and I <laughs> wanted you to get an experience you're going to remember the rest of your life. And he remembered it. He definitely remembered <laughs> it. He got a bunch of pictures next to the crazy buses and vans that people um, create at the Browns Muni lot, and it was it was an experience, to say the least. Um, and it was the worst game of the year for us. The Patriots uh, oh. really, really put it on us. So, but you guys are right in the center of it all. And when I, why, why do I reference, uh, you know, Case Western Reserve? That was your last job, right? Yeah, I was there for three years. Yep. And then before that, dude, I can just remember doing coverages down at Mount Union in a we line. We were your first, uh, we were like Flow Wrestling's first D3 match, I believe. Yeah. And then um, now, Crazy. Now they're figuring out that you can't just like, um, I don't know, just ignore uh, like maybe a quarter of your audience, a third of your audience. And now they've started doing D2 and D3 stuff. I don't know if you've noticed that. I've, I've not actually noticed. But yeah, I mean, we're the D3 is the biggest division, 100, almost 120 schools right now. 
largest division in terms of participation. So I wouldn't, my, and my guess, my thing is, I mean, you know this about me. I'm not like some D one snob. I, I want, I love yeah. wrestling at all levels. Well, you know, and I think the, to that point, um, if you love wrestling, I mean, you can't get enough of it. So I think it's, it's exciting to, to follow all the storylines in my opinion, you're right. Like, Hey, what's going on in D3, D2, NAI, JUCO, D1, high school. Uh, I mean, there's just, there's so much to be excited about now, now with all the women's programs, I mean, yeah, I, I'm with, yeah, I know you're going to stop on it. I, I, I love D3. I think it's, it's awesome, but uh, all wrestling is cool to me. So you, your, your journey through coaching has gone all through Northeast Ohio. You started as an assistant at John Carroll. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I was a GA, but I wasn't, technically a GA for wrestling. I was actually a GA in our, our business college. And, uh, and so I had free time. So I, I, yeah, I was a volunteer my first year as a GA at John Carroll. My second year I was at Notre Dame. So I was, I would work at John Carroll, go to Notre Dame for practice and then come to John Carroll for, for class at night. That was kind of my typical day. And that was the first year at Notre Dame, the first year they had a program with Frank that, and, and Anthony. That's right. That's I remember that now. Is that was 0607? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. 0607 is when Coach Romano and Ralph, Anthony Ralph, um, were, were that was their first year and they were NAIA that year with Notre Dame College. And then I covered mm-hmm. their duel with Purdue that year. I think it was the next year because we was never the next Purdue. year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, we had a rough year that first year that I was there. Um and it was year two they started, you know. I mean, we we're basically all freshmen that first year. But yeah, it was, uh, and I think we had three qualify, maybe one all American that first year. And, uh, and then, and then I left for that and went to Mount Union. So you were coach, yeah. Mount Union, what was the dual meet that I did? Was the dual meet with John Carroll? Or <laughs> it was, it was John Carroll. Yeah, we had, it was, it's funny to say we, cause I'm, I'm flip-flopping with the we. Uh, so at that, it was my second year at, at Mount. And at that point, John Carroll, I think had won six or seven in a row and and they should have they were on paper probably the better team but we just wrestled you know, the match of our lives I guess it was I mean we, we had we ended up having a good team but it was just it was an amazing duel me it came down to heavyweight and I remember I uploaded the matches and Martin Floriani was like this was an amazing duel me <laughs> and he and he took a uh uh they used to have these things called flash headlines their headlines would flash through on these like pictures, and it was a picture of a barn on fire. I remember that. It was so barn good. Burner. It's a barn. I'm like, dude, it's a barn burner. What a great, a real Donnie Brook, and it comes down to the end, and he got, you know, and Martin got behind it. So that that was really cool, man. And I, like I said, they're starting to expand their efforts into D2 and D3 because I think they figured out like it's a it's a huge share of the market audience to just pay attention to the 70 what 77 76 d1 teams right like i think it's a huge it's it's an economical error you're you're doing something that's wrong and you're doing a disservice to the sport of wrestling like you said division three has the most teams right Mm -hmm. i like that you know i like and i i like your journey right and like the thing about you is i always felt like you were and you probably knew this by design that you would come back and be the head coach for John Carroll, no matter, you know, when you're at Mount, when you're at case, like obviously the goal is to get back there. Cause dude, you're like Mount, you're, you're John Carroll through and through, right? Like your dad wrestled there. You wrestled there. You guys are both all Americans there. That's gotta be something that's really important to you. You're from nearby Solon where you live now. I -hmm. mean, it it just makes sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know that I I can't say that it was always in the plan because I, I, I convinced myself that if I thought that way, it just if things wouldn't work out, I I was like, I just have to be happy and, and successful where I am. But like when the opportunity was here, th- yeah, then it became like, yeah, of course, this is no, there's no, there's no doubt in my mind. Uh, this is where I belong. But yeah, I mean, my, I tell this so to like recruits and, you know, people ask me like, Hey, you know, we we're coming here. Are you going to be here for all uh, four years? And I say, well, my mom and dad met in the gym, uh, you know, and uh, 
yeah, this is, this is kind of part of my family now. And, and it's, um, yeah, so I've, I, yeah, I wrestled there. My dad wrestled there. Um, it's, it's kind of, yeah, I love it. I, I've, I live close to it. I've always lived close to here. It's just like, I love it. But yeah. It's, it's a, it's a special place, uh, to me at least and to a lot of people. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's where I, I, I love being there. So does your, do your mom and dad still live in Solon then? They live, they live in your neck of the woods. They're in Bainbridge. Are they Bainbridge, yeah. Auburn? I knew they were geniuses. I knew your dad was a genius. <laughs> I, I live, never knew he was that smart, though. I mean, if he was a live, real uh, bona fide genius, though, he'd be out in Auburn where I am. I'm just telling you. <laughs> yeah, so he's there over by uh, Bear Town. Oh, Bear, Bear Town. You've told me that because you and I went hiking at uh, South Chagrin, and you told me oh, that, yeah, I remember. Yep, yeah, yeah. that's right. Uh, okay, so – the, the big thing for you guys is, you know, when you talk about your dad, your dad was in a super interesting era of NCAA wrestling, all divisions, because your dad won the D3s. Did your dad win it twice? Twice, yes. Dad won the D3s twice, and then the champion, and this is how Carlton has a rig as a six-time champion, because for UPJ, he would win D2, and then he would went and won D1. Three times. He won both three times. He's a six-time NCAA champ. Your dad won D3 and then went, and was he fifth? It, he was fifth. He was fifth in Division One. Yep, yep. So he won it twice. Uh, his junior year, he he did not place in Division One. So his senior year, he uh, he was fifth, yeah. Um, and he, uh, you know, I love my dad, but, but more impressive, Jimmy Weir, he won three titles at John Carroll – division three he took sixth as a sophomore in division one as a junior he didn't place but by today's standards he would have been seventh or eighth they only placed top six back then and then he was fourth as a senior year so so jimmy weir in his john carroll career was like i don't know like 108 was like his record and like six of those losses were at the division one national tournament oh my god and here's the thing You didn't have to do it. You didn't have to go. Some people out. Some people yes. yeah, really didn't go. Yeah. That yeah. is wild. Yeah. That's wild that your dad did that. Like that what your dad did is like the true Iron Man thing. And what weird did, obviously what weird is is very impressive. You know, I'm not gonna slight weird. Yeah, yeah. But we're like, gonna talk. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, hey, well, think pod, about yes. that. To think about like what they did. They went through a war and then a week later, because it was a week later, it wasn't one like week. two weeks later. It was one yeah, week I mean, later. I- now it's we're we're two weeks from our regionals and all that, but but yeah, they were one week out of their D three tournament. So you know you're you're wrestling for a national title on Saturday, and then you're wrestling again on Thursday in the Division one tournament. And I know the landscapes obviously changed, you know, substantially, you know, and you're adding a women's program. To speaking of which, women will wrestle freestyle for you, won't they? They will not yes. wrestle. They're going to wrestle freestyle because women do not wrestle with riding time. They don't have the seven minute matches. So all your stuff, that's like, that's crazy to think about because you're going to be in a freestyle mindset year round now. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's funny. We've, I've already kind of talked about this of how, you know, some of the, one of the, the, the standards that we have, will say, you know, what we work on this, we work on that. And we're like, well, this obviously makes sense, but we have to start fresh on some of these things, you know, related to technique and whatever. But, uh, you know, because, I've yeah, I've never coached a freestyle season. I've coached freestyle matches and and whatever, but not a, a season. So that's it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, I'm like kind of I'm super interested because I've covered the the Tiffins women's wrestling before and went to a practice and saw what they do because it's in conjunction with the men's. But you're going to have to run two separate programs. They're not the same thing. Obviously, when the competition's freestyle and these guys are wrestling folk style, seven minutes riding time versus getting rolled through on your back, giving up exposure. That's a totally different beast. And the matches can be so much quicker in freestyle, as you and I know. Even if you look at the higher levels, I mean, there's some really quick matches. A guy gets a lace, gets a gut, it's over. Girl gets a lace, gets a gut, it's over. Helen Rose rolls people up frequently. Uh, You know, Adeline Gray, same thing. They beat up on people, and they can really get rolling on people. And that can be – that can make the season feel a lot shorter, is my guess, for the women. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and quite frankly, we'll have a abbreviated schedule anyway in that first year. Um, just uh, knowing what I know now, uh, 
you know, talking, going back to what we said earlier, I've coached at a few places, few rebuilding and, and put guys to a grind immediately. Right. In my first season trying to build something up. So we're not going to, we're not going to put these girls through a grind. We're going to probably have, we can have 16 events. We'll probably shoot for maybe 12. Um, but yeah, to your point, um, and it's funny, we, t- we talk about, you know, in the coach's office, if you will, get into philosophical discussions of how folk style is pr- really probably a horrible sport for your body. Um, you know, just the banging, the pulling, just even just top bottom, you're, you're rewarded for just punishing people, <laughs> you know, on top. And in, in freestyle, it's just the finesse. You know, if, if you get in a, a leg lace, it's very uncomfortable, but a really good one's going to be over in, in, um, you know, five seconds, right? Like roll, 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 and you're done. So, so yeah, I mean, I, for sure. Yeah. I think it's going to be interesting to see. I don't think I could agree with you more on how bad folk style college <laughs> wrestling is for you because I got like tar kicked out of me a couple times in college where it was guys on top and they're allowed to do, you know, the bow and arrow foot carry. I got bow and arrowed in a dual meet at Michigan state. It was the number one guy in the country. He was a three time all American. It was a Georgian guy. He was like 27 years old and he kept foot carrying me. And the dude was just (laughs) punishing me. Right. Like, and the thing about it is like, I was doing everything I could. I kept getting single legs on the guy. Just couldn't finish. He was just bigger, stronger, better, older, better looking. I'm guessing too. The whole nine yards, like this guy just tortured me. And it's just such a, it, it is so just such a torturous season. I think it's why though, if you want my, the truth, I think our guys our MMA guys. I think that's why they dominate MMA though, because of the riding time, they're able to control people. And there's so many weigh-ins. There's so many weigh-ins. They're so like adept to the, the weigh-in situation. They're wrestling dual meets on a one hour win. Uh, you know, your guys are wrestling dual meets on a one hour win, mm-hmm. two hour win for the tournament, right? Like it's scratch weight all the time, um, except for the NCAA tournament. And the um are your regionals a plus one the second day? Yeah, yeah, plus yeah, one. So the NCAA yeah. does the same thing, right? It's a plus one the next day. Um, but most everything's scratch, and they're so used to controlling each other and beating each other's bodies up. I think a D one season. I think it's it's arguably harder than anything you can do in any training process, whether it be an MMA, you know, six to ten week camp preparing for a championship fight or whatever. But like, it, I don't, I just don't think there's a question. I think that you that statement, I, I can't agree with that statement more that that folk style college wrestling is probably the most brutal thing you can do to your body. Yeah, it's it's funny. I've heard MMA people who who were wrestlers say they're like, yeah, you know, getting punched in the face is not is not fun but but it's still an easier sport than wrestling kind of for those reasons that you're you you if you get banged up you go well i'm gonna take some time off um and and in college wrestling you're like well this hurts but i'm allowed to go so i'm gonna go and and you just continue fighting and so that's again i don't i don't i i prefer that over getting punched in the face but but people who have done both (laughs) have yeah. said that to me and I'm like, that's, that's an interesting, you know, viewpoint. So, um, but yeah, that's just, yeah. And, and I think it is just the daily, the grinding and just the, the pulling and the yanking and oh. it's just the, 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 the think of a power half, like just, just crushing a neck yes. and it's like, do you want to go over or, and, and get put to your back or do you want your neck to feel better tomorrow? And, or, or I should say, have your neck feel good tomorrow and go to your back or have your neck hurt. And, not give up the points. So yeah, it's just, it's just crazy, but th- that's the fun of it too, I guess. To that position you're speaking of right now, a left yeah. boot in a right crank power half or left, uh, uh, yeah, right boot in left hand. And it's like ringing a rag out. Right. And the body, the body can only go so much. So a guy has to release his leg or a girl has to release their leg. Usually in order, depends on the flexibility of the person underneath, but they usually have to release that leg in order for the person to even be able to turn over. But in college, you're just allowed to punish the people. You're allowed yeah, to continue yeah. to wring them out like a rag, you know, feed them forearms, cross face, come back with an elbow. I mean, it's just such a – that position that you're talking about right there really changes a lot of people, in my opinion. I think it changed me. I can tell you that. I figured out to keep my arms in or keep my hands out front, you know what I mean? Like, don't give up wrist control. 
don't let somebody, you know, snake in here and come here. I mean, it just, it changes. Yeah. I, that's a great point. Like just to that position right there, forearm in the back of your head, cranking a power F, pouring your arm out. Um, what Lance Palmer was really good at is taking the, the elbow out and taking and kind of disabling their ability to, to use these muscles right here. Right. He was really good at that. And I, I just, it's such a punishing thing, man. And, and it's, and it's starting for you guys this weekend coming up, you know, you're at Lake Erie, right. And, and uh, yep. we were going to see a really good matchup at 33 is what I was looking forward to, but they're all American is out. Was going to face your returning uh, national finalist, right? Yes. Yeah. So, they wrestled last year um, it, 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 against when we, we, I wouldn't say dueled them because it's not quite a duel, but yeah, they wrestled last year, close match. Uh, Lake Erie won it. Um, I, I think the premier match is going to be at 174, uh, where they have a all American and we have a, a round of 12 wrestler. So that should be a good one. Um, but yeah, they're strong overall. I think we're strong overall. So it should be, it should be a pretty, pretty exciting. We're not, it's not a dual meet where, when, when Jeff Breeze and I did this last year uh, before Boomer came in, we just, especially coming off of COVID, we're like, let's just get guys matches the first week and let not go crazy. Let's not, you know, try to win a dual meet where you're moving guys, you're shifting. Like, let's just get everybody comfortable and, and get some matches in. And, and we decided to do it again this year. So there should be about 20 matches. Um, I, I think they're all going to be well well fought matches so it's gonna be i think a good event two mats two, two matches, mats yeah. 20 matches we're gonna have the marquee matches the 74 match the 33 is still gonna be a good match from what i heard yeah even though it's not gonna be gamut but um you guys have five guys ranked in the top 20 for john carroll and you're ranked fourth as a team saw earlier today on your social media good job on the social media feed by the way that's good that I know that stuff. That's yeah. that's how that gets out there. I, you know what I mean? Like I even said that to you wrongly. So I said, oh, you got four rank guys. You said, ah, not five, but who's counting? <laughs> that's a big deal for you guys, though. That's a really big deal for you guys to be in trophy-type position this year because the top four teams get trophies in Division mm -hmm. One, Two, and Three NCA. That's a big deal. Would you agree with that statement? I mean, you've built this. Yeah. What year is this, how, what year is this you being head coach right. with John Carroll? eighth year i lose track because of covid stuff but i believe it's year eight uh so yeah i mean from a competitive standpoint as a team <laughs> it's so funny to talk about trophies because we'll like go to a tournament and we get a trophy and i'm always like what are we going to do with this thing like i don't want to throw it out but it's kind of like worthless you know at like a normal invitational let's say but uh but no that nca trophy I mean, the difference between fourth and fifth it's huge. You don't, you don't take home any hardware. It's like, it's like taking fourth in the Olympics. You don't get that medal. Um, and arbitrarily we decided that top three in the Olympics, or I, I guess it's four now with wrestling, but you know, gold, silver, bronze, NCAA, one, two, three, four, all American top eight, right? If you're, and like I said earlier, top all American used to be top six. So, so those guys who took seven, eight back then, they don't, they they didn't accomplish the job because arbitrarily that was not all American. So yeah, top four is huge. If, if that's where we can land, I'd be happy. Um, so yeah, but it's, it's, it's just rankings. It's, we haven't even wrestled a match yet. So we have to take it a, a day at a time. Who are the five that are ranked and what weights and who, what, and what position are they yeah. ranked at? So, so Andrew Perelka returning runner up second at 133, and, and the guy ahead of him is the one who beat him in the finals. Uh, at 149, Kale Bakaizo, he's 15th. Uh, he was a match away from placing, I'm sorry, from qualifying last year. Uh, the guys who beat him were second and third in the country. You know, not to say that he was fourth in the country or anything, but, you know, he lost to two quality guys at the regionals. Top three qualify, so he was fourth. Uh, 157, Luke Rakowski's fourth. He was seventh last year at that weight, although he's actually going to be, we're, we're flipping our weight. So he'll be wrestling 165 this season. And then at 165 ranked, Patrick McGraw's seventh. He was all American round last year, lost in the round of 12. He'll be down to 57. And then Daniel DeVera, the last one, he's sixth at 174. He'll be back at 174, lost that all American round as well. So 
We have, I mean, I think four guys who are really, um, yeah, I don't want to be like, oh, no, all uh, national champ contenders, but I mean, I think that's what they're they're training for. So uh, four, four really big studs uh, with Kale at 149. He's, you know, maybe a step behind, but he's trying to get to that level. Um, and then we have one other wrestler ranked. They do regional rankings as well. One of the wrestlers ranked regionally, and that's Jesse Canazar at 197 so he's he's pretty tough too but uh you know trying to get his his name higher on that list i should say obviously you got to think that peralka can win this year you got to think that you know that that guy he's been in the national final you got to think that guy can win there's got to be no question in your mind no question in his mind right yeah i mean yeah for sure that's the, that's the plan he he's back in grad school uh using his final year of eligibility you know he had the the covid year uh to wrestle to win a national title i think we were gonna we were gonna focus on some stuff this year myself kind of directing his training but but that kind of took a, a different direction because we have a, a different person with him now um new to our coaching staff and that's that's george d camillo so he's been helping andrew a ton um i've seen growth already joe um, george yeah. lives out by me he's a genius yeah <laughs> he lives right by my kids daycare he lives on a, a bell street Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great guy. Great kid. Works at Lincoln yeah. Electric. They don't make him better than George G. Camillo. Great that's guy. Right. So yeah, he's been. That's been huge. So yeah, Andrew. Yeah, I mean, we're we're trying to, you know, I, I guess I I this is how I put it to Andrew. We're, we have to separate ourselves from three and down, and we have to catch up and pass number one, and that's the goal this year. He's a Brexville guy, right? He is indeed. Yep. Oh man, you do a really good job of keeping guys in Northeast Ohio, in my opinion. Thank you. And, yeah. and and tapping into whether it's the you know the greater Cleveland area, I think that you have to because it's Northeast Ohio. Why wouldn't you? This is where you were from. This is where you're born and raised. Mom and dad met in the gym, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so it's like I think it's probably like an easy sell for you to whenever you can bring someone in and they can get a degree from John Carroll and Russell for you guys. And now with the wacky uh, COVID year, what is the latest? that they'll let like what's what year is Peralkin is he in a fifth or a sixth I don't know he's, that. he's in his fifth year so basically with d3 there's no there's no red shirts there's no traditional red shirts um actually there really is no such thing as a red shirt in d3 there's a medical hardship year gotcha but you can't practice if you practice you burn a year of eligibility you can't practice and go to opens that does not exist so yeah he was in his true fourth year last year got his degree but 2021, uh, he finished the season two and zero, and that did not count against him, nor anyone as as a year of eligibility. Wow! So That's yeah, true. he's back in that fifth year, as as well as Luke Rakowski, our our 165 all, all, returning All American as well, fifth year Where, guy. Where's Luke from? Uh, North Canton Hoover. So I once again, Northeast Ohio. You do a really good job at keeping them here in Northeast Ohio. So I talked to. Uh, Boomer, I, we haven't uh, published his podcast yet on the uh, Barbarian Hour because a lot more uh, editing. I, you might beat him to uh, to air, just so you know. Okay. Even though we did his a week ago or earlier this week, whenever it was. I forget when it was, but it should be out because I want it out for, to promote the dual meet with you guys. But long story short, when we talk about D2, he wrestles Cleveland State this year and Josh Moore, right? That is actually bad for Josh Moore to go and wrestle them because it does them. They, it can only hurt them. They gain nothing from it. D2 and D3 don't have the same issue that D1 does because they got the RPI. They got the coaches pull. They got all this other stuff and wild cards. You guys don't deal with the wild card, card stuff. You deal with true regionals, top three in each regional, qualified for the NCAA tournament, no wild cards. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, that's correct. Do you like that you don't have that hanging over your head like all the D1 programs, you know, and there's so few, you know, there's only 70 some left in the country. And they got the only thing they can do that matters to them is beat D1 guys, beating D2 guys and beating D3 guys, NAI guys, JUCO guys. Even if they beat them, it doesn't even go into their win percentage and their match percentage. Do you realize that? Yeah, well, because we we forever, John Carroll, since the 70s, wrestled Cleveland State. And um, in a dual meet, and, and I think it got to a point where 
it didn't make any sense for them. Not that, not that Josh and I've had that conversation because actually we try to, we try to, they wanted to get on the schedule with us this year. Um, but it just didn't work out because we already were locked in with our schedule. But I, I look at them like, yeah, what's, it's crazy that they get nothing out of that where years ago it was a, a rivalry. You'd have, um, you know, thousands of people crazy enough go to watch that match. And, and now, yeah, they don't get much out of it, which is kind of crazy, but um yeah no i think d3 you you can could we have a better system should more guys qualify i mean there's a lot of things that are wrong with our what we have but i i think it's hard to argue a couple things one it's 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 very pure it's divided the 100 and call it 120 teams divided by by six there's roughly 20 teams in six regions kind of mostly fairly divided geographically like a district tournament, you know, so that's, is it, is it always balanced? No, but it's, it's, it's fair. And and top three go, you got to lose twice. You know, you can't say, Oh, well, the best guy in the, you know, used to be in the OEC champ would go, you could have three good guys in a weight class. Doesn't matter. Only one's going. And so, you know what you're getting into, you show up at that regional tournament, you know where you have to finish. So I think if nothing else, it's, it's fair. It is what it is. And, and, Nobody's going to get shocked. Nobody's going to say, how on earth did this guy make it? And that guy did not Who's on the committee? <laughs> you know, we don't yeah. deal with that. Uh, and so I think that's, that's kind of a, a, a refreshing thing with, with what we have compared to others. Do you get a little frustrated when you see one of your guys miss out and realize in that type of system, he'd go, yeah, hundred percent, but you know, they got to win the matches that are put in front of them. Do they have Augsburg and Wartburg separated in regions? They do, don't yeah, they? They do, yes. Okay. Because those are the two teams, for a lot of people who don't know, those are the two teams that kind of go back and forth and who have been traditional powerhouse for the last 30 I plus years, right? I believe, I want to say 1994, Ithaca won a national title. And then in 1995, I could be off by a year or two. Um, 1995 Wartburg or Augsburg has won every national title since one or the other. Yeah. Uh, so that's a fair statement that I, what I just said. Then. Yeah. And now <laughs> they, don't, they don't always finish second. The other one doesn't always finish second, but one of those two has won every title. Uh, Wartburg won it last year by a uh, half a point, I think, or a point. <laughs> so they, they've, they figured out, you know, when it comes down to it. They've got a way different setup, though, because I went to Warburg. Um, it's in Waverly, Iowa. I did a visit. Obviously, really good facilities. We know that facilities are a big part of it. Nice room. Uh, Jim Miller was the coach there forever, um, and he was, like, the real foundation of it all. Um, but what's wild to me is a, a, their team is largely made up of D1 transfers or D1 caliber guys. So it's always odd to me to see who's going to be wrestling and how it's like a fifth year guy. And they always, it's always like, it seems like there's always at least one or two guys on the team. That's a Minnesota guy, a Northern Iowa guy, an Iowa guy. It's always like somebody, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's always a D one guy in the lineup for them that makes the national finals. And it's somebody who transferred there. And it's, it's just, they got a really different setup compared to what you guys have set up. Would you agree with that statement? Yeah, I I think, you know, in general, uh, Ohio, like you'll see guys, so so for sure transfers happen and, um, but like in general too, you'll see freshmen, pure freshmen come in. And I think that to your point, D1 caliber guys, I think there's something, uh, lack of a better way of putting it, it's like more socially acceptable in, in the wrestling world in that part of the country to win two and three state titles and become a division three wrestler. Like, I feel like in Ohio, you know, if you saw a three time state champ commits to John Carroll, the message board would be like, what's wrong with this guy? <laughs> you know, like, I don't like just, that. Yeah, I don't like that. And I agree either. with you. I have a problem with that because when people look down their nose at Tiffin, Finley, you guys, Baldwin Wallace, right? I mean, Notre Dame, cause they're not D1. So many parents are out of touch with the level that their kids are. Like, I'm going to tell you right now, if my kids end up doing D2 something, I'm going to be pretty fired up about it. Or if their passion carries them to be a D3 something in college, NCA, I'm going to be happy. 
or if they can get a full ride and go to the NAIA, I'm still going to be fired up. I'm not this D1 or bust mentality. It's really an issue. That's like something like that's I've always want to ask you guys that question. How does that make you feel with the D1 or bust mentality and people looking at you guys like you're gum on the bottom of their shoe? <laughs> uh, you know, when I when I was younger, I maybe had more strong opinions. I think I, I've grown to like you got to do what you got to do, right? And and if your if your motivation is driven by some different factors, that's that's what's what you got to do. Um, and I think quite honestly, it's up to people like myself and the other coaches in D two and D three to, to help that, you know, it's on me, I guess, as much as it's on the, the parents and those kids, it's we have to make those kids feel like division three is not a letdown, you know, and, and we don't sell John Carroll. Like if you come and visit, I'm not like come here and wrestle because it's going to be the greatest wrestling experience. You'll be the best wrestler. You can be here. You're coming here for, for a lot of reasons, your education, um, your career and, and, and the opportunities and, and the fun and the, and all that stuff. And, yeah, we'll do our best in wrestling too. So, so I think it's on us to find these, these young men and now women who, who think that that's more important than the, 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 the label of their division. So, um, but yeah, it, it certainly can be frustrating. You know, I'll, I'll tell you one interesting kind of story on that point. I, I was talking with a kid a few years back and I'll never forget this one. Cause it just sticks with me. I just say, Hey, you should come check us out. And he said, well, Coach, honestly, like I'm going to wrestle division one or I'm not going to wrestle at all. And I was like, well, what do you mean? Like, why wouldn't you just, why, why not at all? Like if you just shouldn't just be D1, I'm going to wrestle. He's like, well, I'm not sure if I I'm ready for that level of commitment. And I said, well, it sounds to me like, (laughs) it sounds to me like division three could actually be a really good model for you because if you're not ready for that commitment, that's that's the beauty of division three you can come and you can experience it and enjoy the sport go to school have a normal social life and and you know not be all in every day all day with wrestling it's like ah you know i i don't think i could do that it it was just the weirdest thing that he said i i don't want to commit to division one but i don't want to be a part of a division three program it was just such a an anomaly that he had both (laughs) conflicting opinions so it's the, it's the the d1 or bust mentality yeah. that's what it is i listen here i'll tell you this one uh my nephew was an undefeated state champ for oak harbor two years ago Wyatt miller and my brother and i of course we're not him right it's it's his choice it's his life but my brother and i his dad tate we're like man tiffin would be perfect tiffin's like 20 minutes 25 minutes from oak harbor uh, I'm like, oh, man, it would be perfect. He'll be a multiple-time All-American. I think he can win the D2s. And um, he already had it made up in his mind wherever his cousin was that where he was going to go, right? Originally, it was Oregon State, and then it turned into Appalachian State, wherever Ian went, his cousin, he was going to go. And, like, I think that what we wanted, obviously, isn't what he wanted. But, like, we're talking about a guy who had a traumatic – you know, hand injury with, with, uh, you know, he blew part of his hand off. Um, I, I feel like division two and division three would have been great for him. Right. Like, I feel like that it would have been awesome for him. He's had a lot of surgeries on his hip to, to fix his hand. And then he had a great year as a senior, but I was like, our, our mentality was, oh man, he's going to be a great D2 D3 guy. You know, that was like what we wanted, but it's not what the kid wanted. The kid wanted to wrestle for his cousin and he felt like he was a D1 guy. And then his red shirt got pulled last year. And he went 500, right? He went 500, which is hard to do when you're thrown into the lineup as a tweener, 197. But, like, I like – I can, here's what I can say about him. I at least like he, – he's realistic about it. He understands the level. But he was not dedicated, and he wasn't like, oh, D1 or bust. This, that was never his mentality. I think he just wanted to be where his cousin was, and I think he likes wrestling for him now. And I think he likes Coach John Mark and Rando Diabe and the coaches there. Coach Patterson. So he likes, you know, he likes where he's at, you know, and, that, and that's good for him. But like, would I love to see him transfer to John Carroll or, or Lake Erie or Notre Dame or be near me? I'd love it. I'd love it. Right. Like, but I think that a guy like him is a D2 or a D3 guy. Like he's a bona fide multiple time all American, but I think that they, you know, I think he wants to test himself. I get where he's coming from. That other person you're talking about, <laughs> 
it's a head scratcher. I'm I'm like when you're yeah. t- I'm like like that's I'm like oh I'm like what what is this what? Now now I will say, I've I probably said things last week that I regret saying or that was stupid. So so to hold you know someone saying something when they were 18, you know, they're still trying to figure life out, and, and you're, yeah. you're you're being put in. You're making this huge decision. There's so many external factors, and you know I feel I, quite frankly I feel bad. A lot of these kids like between social media um, oh. and just message boards and all this stuff. I think these kids feel an, an unnecessary amount of pressure and weight. That's, that's probably artificial. There's, it doesn't exist. You know, they're, they're not being watched by thousands and thousands of people, but they feel that way. And I think their decisions sometimes reflect that. And I, I feel for those kids, but, but like I said, maybe that's on us coaches to really put our programs out there to make sure you know, hey, you know, John Carroll is an option and there's, you know, other other division twos and threes. And, and right now in Ohio, I mean, we're good across the board. I mean, division three, we have three with three programs, maybe we have four, uh, three or four in the top 20 for sure in the top 30 last year. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're that's great. I mean, that didn't happen 10 years ago. It couldn't happen 10 years ago because of the qualification format. Uh so, I mean, we're doing great, you know, and I think we, we as coaches have to continue to grow. And I think we are, I think everybody's working hard. I, I, I respect every coach, small coach out there. Cause I think they're all busting their butts just like we are to, uh, to build their programs up. You guys are uh, much like when you go to the recruiting table and, and p- people want to talk Turkey, right. They want to talk money. You're similar, obviously to the Ivy leagues. The Ivy Leagues do not – they they compete in mostly Division One sports in the Ivy Leagues. Um, and uh, they have huge athletic programs at those eight schools. Um, but they don't give athletic scholarships, but they're competing at Division One. You're in a similar situation where you guys are not given athletic scholarships. Everything's either grant, aid, leadership, uh, different awards, grants, whatever it may be. So you guys have to get creative with financial aid packages need-based, whatever it may be, you guys are in a situation where you're not given athletic scholarships, but I think you can put com- competitive packages together for kids to come and still be able to leave without crushing debt and all these other things that, that people think of when they think of no athletic scholarships. Yeah, uh, the <laughs> the price tag, the sticker shock, uh, we're, are we like 65? I, it's almost irrelevant because people ask me, well, how, what's your cost? I'm like, the cost isn't isn't relevant because nobody pays that. But we're at like I think I want to say sixty five tuition, room board, everything out the door per year, and that is I mean that is not just the Division three, but that is a small private school model. Is you, you have this high price and and you have aid in, in a lot of different ways, right? There's there's government money, of course. There's student or uh, university grants. Um, so yeah, when students apply at John Carroll, they're gonna get when they get admitted, they're gonna get a, a partial package immediately so like there's you don't have to apply for the presidential scholarship that's just if your grades qualified that's what you get um and then probably january or so you're going to get your your full package which which is based off that plus the fafsa um so i mean yeah if we were sixty five thousand dollars, nobody would be here uh but no, so, so I'm looking at people. Overland's right now. Overland, I just looked Overland's up. Do you know what Overland's? What are about? they? Their tuition's 57, 57, oh, 57, uh, six fifty four books, two grand, other fees a grand, room and board, over seventeen grand. Wow, they're sitting at seventy seven, seventy eight grand. Do, do you remember what you paid, uh, or what not what you paid, but what? Kent State costs when you were a student. Yeah, we did this thing called Kent First, and it was thirty six months, five hundred dollars a month. So eighteen grand for my all my tuition. Wow. And then for uh, I took out a loan that just paid off. I took out like a twenty two thousand dollar loan to pay that off and to pay, but like wrestling scholarship paid for my room and board every semester. Okay. So yeah, I had to come up with uh, thirty six months of five hundred dollars a month. But realistically, it's eighteen grand. <laughs> yeah, realistically, you could have done that uh, bartending or, or sure. waiting tables. Yep. You know, yes. made five hundred a month. 
Um, yeah, John, I want to say John Carroll, when I, when I graduated high school, which was 2000 tuition, room board, everything out the door, full price was like 25,000. Oh, so even, even then that's a lot of money, but, but I mean, but that, but you still, there were still scholarships. Like I, I know I didn't pay nearly that because of just grades and stuff. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting, uh, topic, but yeah, we, we, we definitely make it affordable. Um, not for everybody, you know, there's, it's, there's like a formula and unfortunately as coaches, we don't, we don't know the formula, but we also don't know on both sides. I don't know what, you know, what mom and dad, what their income is. And I don't know what John Carroll's formula is, but right for any of these universities, there's kind of like some sweet spots where you fall academically. There's certain types of, you know, income where, you know, if you make $10 million, well, what do you care that you have to pay a little bit more? But if you're making, you know, certain range, you might be getting not enough aid and you don't really make that much, but you might be below a certain number and you're like, wow, we're getting a lot of help now. So it's, it's kind of funny um, trying to figure it out. Like, I'm just like, really, we just want to sell the university, let kids see it, see if they like it, see if they like our, our program, see if they like wrestling academics. And sometimes it's just like, Hey, cross your fingers and, hope for the best and hope that package package looks good. Yeah. And that obviously that's the biggest thing on kids' minds and parents' minds when they're looking at schools is, are, is this going to be, can we afford this? How, what loans are my kids going to have to take out pay back? The biggest thing is when it's a grant, they don't have to pay it back. Yep. Right. Yep. It's granted to them. It's <laughs> given to them. It's, it's placed towards um, sometimes they cut the kid a check though, don't they? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't see that information necessarily. So a lot of things I hear, but yeah, if you're at a certain level, there's yeah, kids could make money. I think in theory, um, yeah. But I don't know if that happens anymore. I've, I've I've heard those historically. I don't know if I really, and I don't know if we do that. So I yeah, shouldn't. we had Coach Ayers on on the Barbarian Hour with Jared Offer and I, and he said that they have like a sweet spot with mom and dad's um with the FAFSA. And um, they have a sweet spot where it's drastically lower to go to an Ivy and everything's need based at an Ivy. Um, I'm guessing you guys are a similar model. Where it's yeah. Need-based. Yeah. Need based. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think, and I'm teaching, I teach a, a career exploration class right now and just like a, a class to get kids ready for high school. And uh, so many kids have never heard of the FAFSA and a lot of their parents have never heard of the FAFSA. And luckily I'm teaching it to eighth graders. I was teaching it to ninth graders. And a lot of them were like, I just put the website on there and they can't fill it out yet. But a lot of them don't even know about it. College is going to be based off of what mom and dad make. Yeah. You know, and, the, and the, that's good to know. I think that that's good to know uh, as an eighth grader, rather as a ninth grader, because you got more time. Yeah. And, uh, it's just tough, man. It's really tough. And it's, it's your job, right. To get kids in and make sure they have affordable packages. Yeah. 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 And it's, it's, it stinks. Cause I am, I am, uh, I, I like to be in control of a lot of things and it's, it's truly something I'm, I'm out of control of, but, uh, I, I made a decision a few years back. I don't know when, but I, I, I tried not to lose sleep over it. So we, you know, I'd, I'd lose a kid and it was just financially like he's going over here and, and he got a package that he's, I wanted to come to the, to John Carroll, but this is a better offer. And I, that would just like eat me up, you know, like wouldn't sleep at night. And I just said, I'm like, what am I, what am I doing? Not So I, I don't really do that anymore, but yeah, we pr- try to put our best, best, you know, uh, presentation out there. And and if someone likes us, they're going to figure it out. And sometimes they just can't. You guys are uh, John Carroll's Catholic university, right? Yes. So what are all the Ohio ones that are religious based Mount? So, I don't know because there was a the OEC has ten schools. At some point, all ten had a religious affiliation. Okay. Um, mostly, I believe Methodist. Okay. Uh, I think we might be the only Catholic school in the in the OEC. Like Mount Saint Joseph's, I believe is Catholic. Um, but something happened, and I don't want to misspeak, but there was some sort of uh, religious stance that uh one of the churches made 
and the universities basically remove themselves from that affiliation. So I don't want to throw out names because I, if I do, I'm probably going to say the wrong ones. But yeah, but yeah. Pretty- but here's what's crazy about that: Cal Baptist could not go into the Pac-12. The Pac-12 would not take them based on them having theology in their in okay. their mission statement. And obviously, Cal Baptist. I mean, come on. It's in the name of the school. So they're in the Big 12 this year, I want to say. Okay. I didn't that, know that. that yeah. yeah the, the, I know that. Yeah. I, I, well, I, that is a big thing. They wouldn't take them. And they're in Riverside, California, right? It would be like there were a couple of schools that could drive to them. Stanford could drive to them. Um, it, it makes sense, obviously, geographically for them to be in the Pac 12 and not Little Rock, right? Yeah. 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 And yeah. It's so- just, so yeah, most I mean if you really break it down, most most small private schools were built on some sort of religion. I mean, that's just the the nature of these schools. Um, but I think you know, a lot of them you wouldn't even know it if you just and, and not that's that's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just you just wouldn't know. You know, even John Carroll, because we've had some some students um who were maybe uncomfortable with that, but I, I'm kind of like have to help them understand like we're not there's not nuns running around uh you know sending yeah. you to church and stuff you know it's it's catholic by uh you know association and and more specifically it's jesuit which which to me jesuit is more of a uh it's more of an education style than it is a a, a religious style and, and it's something that I, I really am into because it's essentially um the simplest way i describe it it's it's the Jesuit style to me is teaching students to learn how to be students, like not to just here's facts, learn them. It's like, how do you become a student? How do you learn to teach yourself things? How do you find information? And and even my style of coaching, to some extent, I I like to do that. Like I can't do everything for you. I want you to figure stuff out, you know, And, and that's part of the way we do things at times. So it's kind of a cool thing, but sometimes, you know, when you have that religious um title to it it scares people off a little bit yeah but you've had jewish kids on the team I know <laughs> that's right had, yeah you've had a lot of jewish guys sam on gross. the team you know? yeah 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 sam, sam gross is and, and i mean university heights has a very high population of of orthodox uh jews locally and uh we have a we have a jewish studies program we just i think a year or two ago we received an endowment for a Jewish studies like chair, like position on, on campus um, because, because the population is so high right around us that it, it would be foolish, you know, for us to, to not try to bring, you know, all different types of people on campus. You border Beachwood, don't you? Yeah. We're, we're yeah. So Beachwood is, yeah. Cleveland right Heights, University Heights, Beachwood, South Euclid, um, all those areas, that's, those are strong Cleveland. Jewish areas, right? They have, they have yeah. large Jewish population. So it's like, I mean, yeah, like for you guys to do that, it's a no brainer. It just makes sense. And why would you turn that, um, you know, a, a local community, right, who you can draw right in, mm-hmm. John Carroll, and, and include them and be more inclusive? Yeah, that that's a no brainer. I'm glad that you guys did something like that. That's actually highly, highly uh, intelligent on your guys' part. How far are you guys from Notre Dame College? Under a mile, right? Uh, probably like two. Yeah, I mean, Is it two miles? It's really pretty dark close. close. Yeah. Yeah. Like real close. You're you're dead south of them, aren't you? Yeah. So yeah, they're on Green Road. So basically you would pull off Green Road, go to Cedar Road, go to Belvoir. That's it. You know, it's it's two turns. It's crazy how close you are to them. That was wild that you're doing grad school at John Carroll, but coaching at Notre Dame College. I, yeah. I think it man, your your coaching journey has been did did you move to Alliance? I did, yeah. You so were there, I, okay. Yeah, I had a place in uh South Euclid right after school. So I lived there, which which was kind of funny because it was right in between the, the two campuses. So I was pretty pretty convenient. Moved to Alliance and then I came back to Solon when I when I took the job at Case and I didn't didn't move um after taking the job, you know, because it actually cut my commute in half almost. Wow. So, yeah, yeah. Dude, that's crazy. Your 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 uh journey's been awesome. So how many Four D three schools in Ohio had national finals last year. Then, you guys, uh, Baldwin Wallace, St. Joe, and uh, Mount Union. Mount Union, three of the yeah. four had champs. 
Yeah, and uh, good. yeah, and our region had nine in the finals oh, out of six wow. out of six regions. You know, and and I'm not going to sit here and say that makes us the best region, but um, on that metric, you could argue we were. But uh, yeah, we had nine in the finals out of uh, out of you know the 20 finalists. I mean, our our region kicked butt at nationals, and and you know we've had off years too. So, um, but it was kind of cool to see. Cause you know, once you get to, you, you kind of, these are, you fight these guys tooth and nail to get to nationals. And then, but once you're there, they're, they're like the people you like and respect the most. And you, you know, you're cheering for um, these guys, you know, cause unless you're not wrestling, unless you don't go head to head, you want to see the, those teams within your region be successful. Um, and even within our conference, um, I mean, yeah, we had, uh, Three, yeah, three no two national champs in our conference. Uh, BW Mount, we had a finalist. BW had another another finalist. Ohio Northern had a third placer. We had five guys in the top three. Um, wow. That that's you know we compete against those guys, but like that speaks wonders for our conference and to what we were talking about earlier. Like this is a place. This is a, a, a the OEC is a special conference when it comes to wrestling and and you know, kids should, should definitely consider it. If they're looking and want to get a good education and wrestle, like you don't have to, to travel, you know, across the, the country or go to a chase the scholarship. You might have things really, really special right in your backyard. Yeah. That's what I like about it, man. It's just like the, the opportunities. I just like the amount of opportunities that like my sons have with like you guys mm-hmm. being within striking distance, Notre Dame college, obviously Lake Erie up the road. I, I teach a mile from the place. And um, just all the opportunities, if they want to go to the west side, there's Baldwin and Wallace. Kent State's obviously right down the road. Cleveland State, I mean, it just it's all right here. Edinburgh's not far. Mercyhurst, Gann. And I just – I love all the opportunities that, that if my kids end up wrestling that they'll have. And I'm sure you feel the same with, with your sons, right? I mean, it's just – Yeah, well, my kids awesome. only have – they only have one opportunity for college wrestling. That's that's John Carroll. <laughs> well, they only got one <laughs> choice. But here, no, here's a good he, question. Here's a good question. Yeah. You were under Coach Volkman. Coach Volkman also coached football at John Carroll, correct? He did, yeah. So whenever you're a D3 coach, I know that Coach Miller, um, when I used to cover Heidelberg stuff, when Boomer wrestled for Heidelberg, um, he was also the volleyball coach. Then he became okay. like the assistant AD, right? Mm-hmm. Do you have multiple roles like that? Do you stay – are you just – is wrestling your only – job that you have do you have to teach pe classes i know coach anderson's taught physical education classes frank romano's taught classes i know that when i talk to a lot of these people they have other responsibilities do you just have to do wrestling is there anything else on your plate i i have the greatest job in the world i just coach wrestling uh i'm not hold on you know that that's not what i meant you just coach wrestling that's not what i'm saying no no i know i would no, I, i wasn't saying that in that way no i i just coach wrestling i don't i i have taught um they'll they'll be like a a jam maybe hey you know we need someone to take a, teach a, a phys ed course and i do that and and i'll get compensated for it which is cool but uh yeah no i mean i that this is my job coaching wrestling so any anything else is above and beyond you know what i have to do so i i i love it i mean it's it's uh, i've i've had responsibilities in the past and 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 that those kind of what can be wear on you a little bit i would say so yeah i just i just show up every day and run workouts, recruit, and try to make our guys good. Do you eventually graduate into administration, become the athletic director, become uh, some type of person on the board, some type of person in administration for academics, or do you stay wrestling coach? Where are your desires at? And where do you see yourself 10, 15, 20 years down the road? Yeah, I don't know. I I mean, I, I, I could see myself, never leaving this position ever, uh, for sure. Um, but, but I guess thinking about just women's wrestling, you know, uh, as one example, I never thought I would coach any other team other than my wrestling team. And now my wrestling team is a men's team and a women's team. So having, uh, say the love I have for, for John Carroll, um, if an opportunity was like, like that was available, I would consider it. I, I don't know that I could walk away from coaching though you know of of developing athletes developing people that might be a tough thing to walk away from now if you could do dual duties that might be a different story so 
yeah, I don't know. That's that's a tough one. What do you guys ultimately have to do to catch Augsburg Wartburg? What do you guys got to do? Whether I, and I know you're not worried about Mount. I know you're not worried about BW. I know you're not worried about Mount St. Joe, Ohio Northern. I know you're not worried about the other OAC schools. You're worried about John Carroll University. What do you guys got to do, and what's going to have to happen for you guys to really get into a situation? where you guys can take a gold trophy home. You know, I think this year you guys got a really good opportunity to bring a trophy back, whatever, you know, color, maybe if you get hot, whatever happens, but what do you got to do ultimately yeah. to catch those teams? I think, well, I'll, there's, there's two answers to that. And I've, I've told, we don't talk about goals a lot, team goals. Uh, and, and I've told our guys like, well, I don't, I don't care if we win a national title guys, that's not the goal, but like, can we have four national champs this year? Like I, we have four guys who, who that's what they think. And if they think it, there's probably two or three more who th- can think it. So I guess it's, but we can't decide whether or not, you know, another school has four second semester transfers, right? Like that's beyond our control. So we're just going to focus on the individual success. Um, but that being said, I still want to win, right? I want to win every match, every duel, every tournament, every thing. So to, it's just continuing the course we're on. I think we we've improved every. Um, we're finally getting you know to the point where almost every year we have a good freshman, and that freshman you know at least we know we have someone for the next three years. Um, I think it's just staying the course, but at some point we have to have something spark us. So, um, we're getting a new room, you know. So that's happening here in two years. So I hope maybe that puts us on the map a little bit uh, for like, wow, these guys have a special facility, right? You know, so maybe that attracts somebody who who otherwise we're not going to get. You get one more stud, 20 more points at the national tournament. That's what it's going to take to win that title. Um, and I think maybe maybe it's not possible until you get some trophy, right? Maybe we need to take that fourth place home and then kids start to notice us and you get one or two more kids. Uh but I don't know. I mean, right now we just kind of take it a day at a time, trying to make every guy we have the best they can be trying to go after the best kids we can find recruiting wise. Um, we were building a great staff. I mean, uh, the staff we have this year is pretty special. Um, kind of make me look bad. Honestly, I'm like, there's like six state champs, you know, if we go back to high school credentials and then, <laughs> and then me, uh, you know, who's so- on the staff. You so, said George, but who else yeah, is on the staff? Yeah, so the staff uh, includes. Uh, I'm probably going to miss somebody. So my 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 right hand man, if you will, is Bill Spleet, who's uh, he coached at Manor back in the day. Was a, a St. Joe's wrestler. Uh, uh, had a, a, an abbreviated college career. Um, he would but, tell you that he had a cup of coffee at Indiana. That's what I'll yeah, tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'll, I'll if I'll let him tell the story one day to you. To you, uh, Frank Romano's with us still. Uh, he, he's he retired from Notre Dame and and for about um, you know two months and then decided to to get back into coaching with us. Uh, George, obviously, I said uh, Kevin Shadrack. He's been with me forever. Uh, you coach Shadrack at Mount. That's right. Another guy from Mount named Tyler Johnston, uh, who I coached, who uh, he's, he's an awesome guy. And then uh, Danny Anderson, who was uh, all American at Mount as well, although older than me, but, and then, and then he's not started yet, but he's starting here in a couple of weeks when he moves back into town is Garrett Leinberger, uh, who wrestled at Notre Dame. And so he's going to be huge for our, our big guys. He was a two-time national champ at 184. Um, and we didn't like, I was a 174 pounder in college and, and I weigh about 175 now. Like our, like we need someone with our big guy. So Garrett, he's going to be, he's going to be great. Uh, once he gets in, he's still in Maryland, he's moving back into town for not for us, but it just kind of works out. So, so yeah, we have a great staff. I mean, George, like Andrews, that's George's, you know, George's deal. You know, we're just kind of having that where a lot of times as the head coach, I'll get spread thin, but now I'm like, wow, we have a huge staff. We have a good staff. So maybe that's the difference too, right? That individual personal development. So I do, there's a thing we talk about in, in, in our room, which I say it's, it's literal and it's figurative attack from every angle. Like in this sport, you have to attack from every angle. Um, but 
outside of the sport, you know, school, you have to attack from every angle. Career, you know, coaching, we're developing guys in the room, we're attacking from every angle. We're recruiting, we're we're building better facilities, you know, we're trying to do it all. So that might be it. Um, and if not, <laughs> we'll we'll reassess next time. How does Mark Har- Haywald and John Carroll wrestling change that perception, that cultural perception, like what Iowa has, where good two and three time state champs can go wrestle at D three, Wartburg, Co College, right? They can go to all these different schools. Iowa has very strong Division three wrestling, a very strong league. Obviously, Wartburg, Augsburg, um, two separate ones. One's in Minnesota, one's in um, Iowa. But how do you guys get to the acceptability of Ohio kids, PA kids winning or state finalists coming and wrestling D3 and changing the perception of that? How do you do that? I think it's um, – so I think a lot of kids want to wrestle D- Division three. They just don't know it. They just don't know what we have to offer. They don't know that we fit them. So I think it's just helping them understand it's getting our, our name out there. It's getting our, our product out there of saying, do you love wrestling? Yes. Do you love waking up at 6 a.m. And, and doing two a days? No. Okay. You sound like a division three wrestler. Like it's it helping them understand we, we kind of have the best of both worlds. I, I love division one. I love what those kids do. Um, the commitment, the, the, the desire to just be a part of something special. Um, but there's other things that are special too, right? And, and that's what we have to help communicate. So it's just communicating, getting our, our name out there. I think that's the biggest thing, getting our product out there and, and then showing the success, you know, I think that's probably huge too. Uh, you know, the in hindsight for me being 2020, D2 or D3 obviously would have been a better setup for me as far as uh, the goal of becoming an All-American or making the NCAA tournament would have been way more in line with, probably my ability level and what happened um, for me in college. I wouldn't tra- trade a thing. I have my wife and kids because she was a volleyball player at Kent state. And, you know, but my wife, she's realistic. She's from Ann Arbor, Michigan. You know, the big question I always ask is why didn't you go to Michigan? Your mom went to Michigan, everybody in your family. She had a cousin who won the NCAAs uh, with Michigan in hockey. He's a surgeon now. So, you know, she had very high expectations and her family was, was pretty good at everything. Right. But she's like, I wanted to play. I wanted to play. I didn't want to go and be a practice player and sit on the bench and never play and you know, or get when when we were when Michigan was crushing people. She's like, I wanted to play. I think that we need more people just being realistic with themselves and understanding what you're what you literally you hit the nail on the head. Do you want to get up and do two a days twice a day? Do you want us to be holding money over your head? Do you want you know, like if you miss a, a workout, is it going to be the end of the world? You know, like if you miss rehab for your shoulder, right? Like I, I, it gets ticky tacky in D1, man, what they do to those kids. And it, it's just tough. And I think people need to just be more realistic with themselves. And that's what I like about my wife. Very realistic. Very yeah. realistic. And, and you know, that's that's something special. But a lot of people are, are out of touch. For sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, <clears throat> for division – and outlaw just look at division one football as an example. Um, and, and money's not the whole thing, you know, the only thing in the world, but when you're making five, six, seven million dollars, you have one job. You, your job is to win games. Yep. And would I like more money? Like everyone, yeah, I would like more money, but th- there's nothing tied into my job about about winning. And I think it's helped me stay you know, pure in many ways, many ways of just like, we're here for the kids. We want to win. But like when kids are hurt, I'm like, okay, well, see the trainer, take time off. You, oh, this weight's too much to cut. Well, maybe it's the wrong weight class. Like, but yeah, if I was tied into money and and that kid was tied into money, I don't envy that situation. That that, that could get very ugly, very quick. And and I, I, yeah, that's why I like where I'm at. Um, yeah. And I think like, I'll give you, I'll give one last, like, I'll give like a John Carroll, a little uh, sales pitch. Like we go to Florida every year and we do a, about a 10 day trip down there where we compete on the front and the back end. And we train in the middle. Uh, we were just in Spain this summer. Like I want, I want our kids to be like wrestling has given me so much more than wrestling. And I think that's another thing that division three, we can afford to offer. Right. I mean, we can, 
I know like on international trips, it's like, all right, we're going to go to the, the, you know, junior worlds in this cool country. Half the time they they're in, they're out, they compete, they leave. And, and if, if I had my kids, they're like, let's go see some stuff, <laughs> you yeah. know, let's go do some things. And, and yeah. I think that's the, the deep, so helping kids understand, like you can, you can kind of have the best of both worlds, you know, maybe you're not going to be a, a world champ, but you're going to have some pretty cool experiences and, and still compete and have a lot of fun. So or we could take you to Italy and you can wrestle the world champ. That's right. Oh yeah. Yeah. But so <laughs> we, yeah, that was the last time we, we had one of these. So yeah, the, we went to Italy. So we were, did Spain this summer. 2019 was Italy. And we, they changed the UWW changed the tournament on us and they made it this international ranking series event. So yeah, our guys were they're wrestling world champs. You had a guy wrestle to me though. Uh, the case kid wrestled Chimizo. Our guy wrestled the uh, the Russian world champ, who now wrestles for another another country over there. But uh, God, the, 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 the funny thing is, though, I feel like someone said, "Like, hey, I think we should have spent more time on our on our gut wrench defense." And I was like, "No, like we shouldn't have. There was nothing we could have done in prepping for this event." Nope. That nope. we would stop these gut wrenches. You should have started your gut wrench defense when you were six years old, like that yeah. guy started his gut yeah, it wrench. Was like, it was like the it was, it was almost every match was takedown, gut, 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 gut match over. Um, and I was like, yeah, these guys practice gut wrenches every day against people who practice defending gut wrenches every day. And for that trip, it's a summer deal. We're allowed a 10 day like exclusion that we can practice outside of season for those international trips. We had 10 days of training to go wrestle these, these guys. Come European. on, come on guys. <laughs> We're here for the experience. Not for the, yeah. not for the gold medal. Here's what's That's wild. Right. Whenever they say stuff like that, I think Ian was, uh, my nephew Ian was coaching a guy in the, in the blood round. And the guy might've wrestled like Michich and Michich kept tilting him and, and they, they get off the mat and the guy like might've like major detect him round of 12 blood round. Right. The guy's a fifth year senior. And he says to Ian, he's like, hey, we got to work on my, we got to work on my hand control and I got to get my hands back. And he's like, dude, you're, you're done. You don't, not, you don't <laughs> need to worry about hand control ever again. Yeah. He's, like, he's like, hey, I'm proud of you. You did a great job, but just move on. Yeah, you, you got to appreciate that too. Yeah, hey, hey, you, you, you did your best. I mean, you wrestled a guy who's an Olympian. I think you did, you did okay. And the guy's like, I just, I got to get my hand control down. <laughs> well, that would, uh, uh, yeah, we can't go back in the DeLorean and the uh, flux <laughs> capacitor, you know. But, okay, Coach Haywald, we are towards the end here. Do you have anything else for me? No, I appreciate what you're doing and, and have been doing for a long time. Uh, so thank you. How long How long have you been doing between Flow, Go Ohio Cast? It's, it's got to be 15 years now? Yeah, 15. Uh, close. Coming up, this is – so 08, yeah, going on 15. It'll be 15 this year. This coming year, yeah. So fifteen. It's been a minute. Yeah, yeah. I think it's awesome. I think uh, you know, have have it in our backyard is is pretty awesome to promoting these teams because I'm sure there's places out there that you know can't can't get anywhere close to this kind of coverage. So so yeah, thank you for everything you do. Well, hey, thank you for the time. We're gonna get you guys up and ready to go. You'll 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 beat Boomer onto the airwaves, even though you guys are gonna be scrapping it out. <laughs> on Friday, six o'clock, live on Go Ohio, live on a couple different. We're gonna have a couple different feeds. Put the uh, the 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 marquee matches out. Stick around for a little bit here. Thanks for the time, Coach Haywald and John Carroll Wrestling.